Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chantal, and uh, I'm a grateful recovering addict of the hopeless variety. One who sadly turns to sugar to numb and ease her pain, eats compulsively to hide and stuff her emotions, cleans, plans, or organizes obsessively to calm her ruminating thoughts. And when all else fails to satisfy my aching soul, my fears start directing the show as I hold on tightly to my expectations and desired outcomes by using persuasion, manipulation, resistance, judgment, and even criticism to influence my circumstances. Oh, if only I could reach beyond myself, then I could see that all that I've actually accomplished is creating a S dot 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 storm filled with drama, gossip, and chaos. My heart is sick with resentment, rebellion, and resistance to reality. Yet I continue to stand in the eye of the storm. <clears throat> when Vicky and John asked me to speak about um, my spiritual awakening experiences, I was really excited to dig in the little deeper and uh, hear what God had to say. You know, I was confident and expecting uh, for him to do a new thing. And as always, he's delivered. <laughs> um, I so continue to be in awe of his faithfulness, especially when I look back at the transformation he's already done in my own life um, and how his timing is always impeccable. And as a result, I can't help but want to be faithful uh, to him in return. But I struggle with that. It's not easy. Um, the first time that I uh, had an open, honest, and responsible communication was actually 10 years ago. It was in the springtime, and it was in the context of a personal growth weekend that I agreed to discover and recover my lost soul. Back then, the, I was the furthest thing from an open-minded student, not very willing to learn, grow, or change. While people said I was aggressive, I would argue that I was merely assertive. I was known to be direct. It was my way or the highway. After all, I was right. And even if I wasn't, I needed to be right. So I would persuade and press in no matter the cost, as long as in the end my desired outcome was assured. Otherwise, I might just abandon it altogether. Yet, because fear directed my choices, I chronically suffered of paralysis by analysis. This is where, even though I had researched and acquired all the information I needed to make an informed decision, I chose not to because I worried that, about what would happen if I chose wrong. I didn't have the openness to explore the possibility of making another choice. I did not have the openness of trusting God and watching what he would do and work out in my life. Therefore, I was paralyzed, doubtful, and insecure, lacking trust in my ability to think and reason, <clears throat> leaving to a life where instead of making better choices, I simply made no choices. So now if we look at this spring, after experiencing some significant breakthroughs, I can finally say that I'm committed wholeheartedly to my own emotional sobriety. Even though I mentioned the substance addiction of sugar, God has assured me that by dealing with my emotional sobriety, other things will fall into place and take care of themselves. I know and recognize that um, it took me 10 years to get to this point. And some would say that that makes me a slow learner, but I would argue that makes me a lifelong learner. After all, my habit of arguing with others is long ingrained, but at least I've started to change little by little and the same goes for the spiritual principle of openness. It is about progress, not perfection, and connection, not isolation. Openness encourages listening, a kind of listening that addiction, arrogance, pride, and self-centeredness might have closed me off, might have us closed off. In fact, if I'm closed off, then I begin to shut down to growth and become deaf to God. The degree to which I listen is a practice that strengthens over time. Most people listen long enough to interrupt in order to say what they want to say. Yet hearing others and listening to them are two very different skills. Listening requires all the senses. 
Listening includes listening to the expectation experiences of others like we do today in our group, relating to others, listening to ourselves, but most importantly, listening to God. Listening asks us to look at our heart, to understand what's being communicated beyond words. This is the sort of listening that strengthens my, my faith and trust and respect. Openness leads to connection, which is the opposite of addiction. We've heard that before. For me personally, I know that if I remember concepts, experiences, and steps, be no longer being my expectations and outcomes, I'm free to try and experience these new things for myself. Regardless of my spiritual state, I first had to give up in order to become willing to believe that recovery was even possible for someone like me. Letting go of old ways that no longer serve me and creating a safe space to receive, exchange, and replace old unhealthy habits and behaviors with God-conscious faith in action. Life is all about learning from mistakes, being more present in each moment, and accepting that nobody has all the answers, least of all me. My need to be right has been the biggest hindrance to an open mind. Being open-minded means being able to listen and have a willingness to consider new possibilities and even having a sense of humility to accept that even sometimes I can be wrong. Not often, but sometimes. I'm going to encourage you as I continue to speak to close your eyes. I want to share with you an example of a way that I get to experience new and unfamiliar things. What I do before I start these things is apply the idiom of starting with a clean slate. Starting with a clean slate gives you an opportunity for a fresh start. It gives you permission to make mistakes, to write from the chalk in one hand or erase and wipe away what you've written in the other hand and explore different choices and even change course along the way. There is no record of old offenses or debts. This expression alludes to the slate boards on which schoolwork tab or tavern bills were recorded and easily wipe off chalk. Since 1850 or so, the term has been used figuratively and it has long outlived the practice of writing on slate. But more importantly, and key to any spiritual awakening, is the fact that there is no record of old offenses or debts. This is what God did for each of us. This is why Jesus came, died on the cross, and rose from the dead. He took our death for us, paying our debt for our spiritual malady, so that anyone who believes in him will experience an abundant life. Listen to me now. This may be meant for you. Your debt has been wiped clean and forgiven. You are forgiven and you are loved. Those very words are what prompted me to forgive myself, to move from self-loathing to self-compassion. And I hope that it can encourage someone who hears this message. So I will um, make a caveat. My experience of the big book and 12-step program is um, a beginner's level at best. I have not done a 12-step and I have not read the big book from cover to cover, but I still have more spiritual experiences that I would like to share. Um, since coming back to Life Lab, I've been using a daily reader called Serenity, a companion for 12-step recovery, and it's complete with New Testament Psalms and Proverbs, which means I get to use it uh, in my daily practices of reading a psalm, a proverb, and a chapter of the New Testament. And, and that in itself, I think, is, is kind of neat because the book was published in the 90s. And the copy I have comes from my mother-in-law. And it was actually addressed to my husband. So I, I love this, how, how these things carry through in our lives. And um, I'm, as I'm about to become a grandmother, I think often about what type of legacy I want to live. And do I want it to be the brokenness that brought me to the rooms? Or do I want it to be the beauty from the ashes that, that's going to bring glory to God? So most certainly I want it to be the latter, um, but it still takes work. 
So the devotion I'm going to read is actually on step two, where it says, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And in my own experience, even that has required a degree of openness uh, for me to be able to move through that. In terms of came to believe, we say in the devotional, it suggests a progress and a progression of faith that evolves over time. A portion of A's oral tradition defines this as a three-part unfolding. I love things that come in threes. It's so easy to remember. First, we came. That is, we showed up and stumbled into the room. Second, we came to. That is, we sobered up, came to our senses, and began to experience emotional sobriety. Third, we came to believe. We began our real recovery process and our spiritual growth. This style of spiritual growth recognizes that each person must come to an individual knowledge and understanding and spiritual experience of God. It is a logical outgrowth of step one, where we've admitted our powerlessness. Then the next step is to seek a new source of strength or power to take charge for us and to make us sane. For some people, spiritual conversion is dramatic, but for most, however, it is very gradual. But as one grows and matures emotionally, one also grows spiritually. And when I read that, because I've been reading it regularly, it just reaffirms that what God spoke to me about seeking emotional sobriety was more pressing and more important than trying to um, dilute my recovery and deal with the spending and the sugar addiction and the compulsive eating and the this and the that. And it just emphasized for me the importance that he has placed um, on me to daily seek him first. And again, um, I also believe that this speaks to our ability to spirit up. We must be ready to replace what is removed with healing, with healing spiritual growth, and personal relationship. And I believe that's something that all of us can do. And uh, just from experience, and I've heard in the rooms that God always replaces with better. And to me, that's a great way to spirit up. Spiritual experiences are not one size fits all. If anyone's like me, they've probably compared their experiences to those of others. But it cannot be done. It will only rob us of our abundant life. This weekend, actually, when I was... Uh, in a creative time with a friend of mine, we were talking about how different our, our projects were. And the beauty is, is we stopped and recognized that we are each as unique um, and that God made 7 billion different versions of us. That's how unique we are. And not even a single fingerprint is repeated, sometimes not even in twins. And, and I think that when we're open to the, that possibility, that awesomeness then we can better connect with what it is our creator has uh, planned for us um, most of my experiences have been progressive however many 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 come immediately through song lyrics that i hear uh, at exactly the right time um, and they respond to the silent prayers of my heart so uh, if we have time i'll share a few of those later um, I was really taken aback this week because uh, I found myself in a chaos storm and it started on Sunday. And when I went to bed Sunday night, I was grateful that I hadn't had sugar and I hadn't overeaten. But then it turned into Monday and fuel was added to the fire. And because of all the kinks in my hose, I didn't have access to God. By nightfall, I was spewing out what I believed was righteous anger and sharing my opinions with people I trusted. But in the end, all I had succeeded in doing was creating another storm. My heart was sick. And I stood at the center of it, not able to figure out how I got there. Then on Tuesday morning, I woke up and realized that I could silence the noise, drama, and rumination by turning off all my social media notifications and removing Facebook from my phone. That small act instantly almost brought peace and a different surrounding, a different environment. And I realized that on Monday, I had not intentionally connected with God. 
And that's something as simple as not engaging in listening prayer for me. It might be different for you. Here I was reacting to my circumstances instead of approaching God with a humble soul, a willing heart, and a teachable spirit. Sometimes being open-minded means looking back at what I've experienced so that I can learn from it and put the necessary guardrails up and course correct so that I can stay on the right path going forward. Is anyone doing a time check? Um, I have like five more minutes. 1230 is, is your cutoff. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so there's two other experiences that I wanted to share. I'm now kind of just waiting to see which one I'm being prompting to share first. <laughs> I think I'll keep it to the daily practices. So um, by reading, by following the daily practices of Life Slide, I've been reading Psalms daily. And I'm open to learning and applying these different strategies. I can really identify with King David and recognize that his experiences model a way for me to connect with God and to know a peaceful life. Like David, I seek to use my intimacy with God as a weapon, a shield against the people, places, and things that rob my serenity, hinder my courage, and put a kink in my connection to God's wise counsel. In Psalm 143 specifically, David was losing hope. He was caught in fear and depression. At times, too, I feel caught and devastated and discouraged because after all these years, I'm still not able to pull myself out. But I can choose to come to God like David did. If King David could consistently move out of his tailspins as he remembered God's character, reach out to him in prayer, trusted him and sought to do his will, then there is still hope for me and for you. Oh, there were three experiences. Hmm. Um, okay, this will be the last one then. This is the breakthrough and the experience that brought me to commit to my own emotional sobriety this spring. So it gave me an opportunity to heal my younger self. And um, how it came about was I gave my therapist permission to explore why eating sweets and memories of sweets brought me such a sense of belonging, comfort, and love. We often say that when we're addicted to a substance, it's because we're trying to fill a void or we're trying to meet an ease and comfort that is often outside of us, but we don't always recognize that. So what was spiritual about this experience for me was recognizing that as a child, I believed something that wasn't truth, but I carried it with me anyway. So um, every good memory I have of my father involved sweets. Either he'd give me a coin for a small paper bag of Swedish berries from the Dipanar, or on Saturday mornings, we'd take car rides to the pop shop where we bought and enjoyed pop of the cream soda variety. I prepared and cooked meals to feel useful, baking desserts for his sweet tooth and finding recipes that took into consideration his food allergies. As a result, as a grown-up now, at least on an intellectual level, I recognize that love does not equal sugar. So that assumption, that belief that I'd made as a child that sugar equals love, I can now see, at least intellectually, that it, love does not equal sugar. At a heart level, I can finally commit to gardening, guarding an open and teachable spirit to explore what love is. What's God's love? What's self-love? What does that look like? What does receiving love from others look like? And what does love for others look like? And the reason why I shared this particular experience is because um, there's always been a thread of hope or a connection of dots in my life from my experience 10 years ago to my experience today. And it was approximately 10 years ago where I started writing a blog. And the blog is called to love abundantly because God had imparted to me that I, my, my purpose was to lead others to victory through encouragement. Hence the acronym LOVE, lead others to victory through encouragement. And I've been working, walking that path faithfully, but not perfectly. And um, by being connected 
to uh, Union City Church and uh, Community Life Church, I feel that I'm walking in the purpose that God has for me to love women, to, to bring them out of recovery and, and to show them the grace uh, of God um, for their own lives. Um, and I'm really appreciative of the listening prayer practice. Uh, even just yesterday, I could sense God comforting me with his warm and wise embrace. He was saying, and it was about this message. He was saying, trust me, trust my word and my voice. You got this. Keep leaning into me. Stop doubting yourself. The enemy cannot deceive you because you are mine. My spirit dwells in you and you have the mind of Christ. His plan, purpose, and perspective will prevail in your life. So I'm looking forward to many, many, many more spiritual experiences and uh, hopefully soon having a coffee type conversational uh, experience versus uh, speaking via Zoom. Thanks for listening, everyone.